Here we are on the front of our Grand Design Reflection 297 RSTS. We're going to do a technical walkthrough on this unit, just like you would get on the data delivery from a technician, going over the operation of the components on here. Yours may vary in brand name of some of these components, and you want more information on that or deeper dive on these, you can find that on our Great American RV YouTube channel under the playlist Haps Helpful Hacks. We're going to start in the front here. We have our seven-way plug. It's going to transfer all the lights from our towing vehicle onto our unit, and it also has a battery charge line. That battery charge line will pull off the alternator of the vehicle, charge our battery while we're traveling down the road, and we also have our brake control wire. That brake control wire feeds through there, activates the brakes on our trailer whenever we hit our pedal. We're also going to have our breakaway line. That breakaway lanyard right there is to be hooked onto our receiver hitch where we hook our safety chains on, latch it on there. It's there for in the event that those chains and hitch fail, it will pull the pin out of that breakaway box and activate the brakes on our trailer, bringing it to a stop. That can only happen if we have a good 12 volt battery on our system. If we don't, that system is not going to operate. So it's a good idea to have that uh, 12 volt battery charged up and in good shape. That pin also needs to be in that box at all times. Make sure before you travel that it is. We also have our 12 volt power jack that is going to go up and down, has a light on it. We also have our power wire that's going to run over our battery system. You'll have an inline fuse on there that can blow, that can keep this from working. Also, if our battery is not charged up, it cannot work as well. If we can't figure out what the problem is, we can remove that black plug right there, put our crank handle in there, and manually operate that jack to get us out of a jam. Behind that, we have our dual propane tanks right here under this cover. Those are operated by our dual propane regulator. That operates by having both of our tanks on. We kick on that system and we choose that selector as far as which tank we want to be our primary. That gauge will read accordingly if that tank is full or empty and you run that system. Once it runs dry, it will automatically kick over and start pulling from that secondary tank. Now your gauge is still gonna read on your primary until you swap that selector over to that other tank, at which time you can get your former primary tank refilled or replaced. Behind that, we have our 12 volt battery. That is where our rack is for those batteries for our unit. On our driver's side, we have access to our pass-through compartment with our control center. We also have our Furion solar controller, which converts our solar power into charging power for that 12 volt system. Then we also have our Lippard tire link monitor right there that also has the sensors for our tires we can monitor our tire pressure and everything while we're traveling down the road. We're also going to have our electric leveling system. If you notice, we have our levelers down on the ground, and this is an actual leveling system. They look similar to our stabilizer jacks that are only stabilizers, but these are actually levelers. You can get in the uneven ground, it will automatically level your unit. So we'll go over the operation of that right now, as well as touch on our control center and give you more information on that. So we can see here we have our LCI electronic leveling system for our travel trailer here. Uh, we'll run through the functions on here. First, we'll just run off of if we just got to the campsite, we've pulled the unit off of our tongue jack. We want to go into auto level. You can just hit auto level right off the back and those jacks will come down and level out your unit. From there, if we are ready to go ahead and head home, we can hit our arrow down and go to auto hitch height and it, would, it wouldn't say unavailable here. It would just say available, you would hit enter, and then those jacks are gonna raise up and your tongue jack is gonna go back in the same position it was in whenever you detached it from your truck, so no more guessing games there. So after we have our truck backed up to the hitch, we can come in here to auto retract rear, which is the third option on here. We wanna hit enter and it will retract those rear jacks. You can do that or you can retract all of them either way that's an option as well and then just use the tongue jack to go ahead and set the ball on the ground you always want to make sure all your jacks are retracted before you hit the road manual level is if we want to tweak it a little bit we've gone through auto level and our sister or maybe our door is still kind of closing up on us or something's just not quite right this thing is only going to get it so much in level uh, so if we've got to make some minor adjustments, we would go into this manual mode right here. We would hit enter. We can see our degree marks right here. So as we adjust our levelness, either from the front, the rear, the right, or left, 
we'll see our degree marks change. And the objective, of course, is to get zero. More than likely, if we're in auto level, we have zero already there, and we're just trying to make a little tweak. You would just tweak it with your front, left, right, rear, however you would like to do it. Also, in manual mode, we can go ahead and do an auto retract, which would retract everything in there. If we scroll down one more time, we can see left front, right front, and rear, right rear. So what you're seeing right here is the stroke of the jacks and how far out there they are, how, how extended they are. Now, if your pad that you're setting up at is extremely unlevel, you may have to get some blocks for it because eventually this system will stroke out because it's only gonna go out so far. Another option on here, if you are in that manual mode, I forgot to mention, is this retract. If you need to retract the jacks a little bit, hold down that button till it lights up and then just hit your jack, front, right, rear, left, whatever, and it will actually retract those jacks. That's pretty much it in that system. We can hit enter to exit that. Whenever your system first turns on, this would be the screen that you have. You're gonna have your voltage on there. Now you do need a really good 12 volt system on here. If you don't have a good battery and you're not charging it whenever you run this system, it is likely you're gonna have some faults in here. So keep that in mind. On our control center, we have our satellite cable and auxiliary ports for our coax connections. If we have outdoor satellite, we can hook that up. Part cable, we hook that up there. And if we have a third connection we'd like to run through all our TVs, we can hook that up right there. We have our quick connect right here for our blue coiled hose. We can hook up a spray port there. This coax port on the side here runs directly to our outside TV that we can go ahead and hook whatever we want directly to that as well. We have a switch over here for our front cap lights and our slide lights. And we have another switch up in the top right corner, kind of hard to see, that is our water pump. That 12 volt water pump will pull from our onboard water storage and it will supply water to our faucets on the inside in the event that we have actual water in that tank. We'll talk about how to fill that in a second. Our other option is our city water connection. Our city water connection is right here. This is where we would hook that water hose up. If we have a bib at the campground, we can hook that water hose up, turn it on, that will supply water to our fixtures. So if you didn't have that, you wanna fill your fresh tank and use that water pump. Right here we have the combination of all the different options for how our water can go out into our unit. So we have our dry camping. So this would be if we have already filled our tank, we would go ahead and turn it to here. We turn that water pump on and it will pull from that tank. Next one is our power fill tank. We would have it in this option here to be able to fill that tank through that city water connection there. Now that onboard storage, once you add water to it, that does add more weight to our unit. If we don't want it, there is a valve underneath that we can go ahead and pull that and drain that water out. We don't want any more than what we need because of the added extra weight and we don't want to leave it in there too long because that water will become stagnant over time. If we have a city water connection at the campsite, we can go ahead and hook that hose up right here, turn it to this configuration, and then we have our city water directly out to all of our stuff. Winterization option would pull from right here into our unit and that end of that hose would need to go into a bottle of RV antifreeze. This is to be able to winterize your unit. There are more steps to this process. You can find that in your owner's manual or in our video on HAPS Helpful Hacks. Our last one is siphon sanitize to tank, which would be this configuration here. That is to sanitize that onboard water storage tank. You could do a mixture of bleach and water into that tank to go ahead and sanitize it and clean it out. Our next option over here is our black tank flush. That is to go ahead and flush out that sewage system out of our black tank. We would hook that up. We'll talk a little more about that when we get to our tank system. We do have a gray tank valve right here for that secondary gray tank outlet over here. Once again, we will go over the gray and black tanks when we get to those outlets and we have a GFCI protected outlet right here on the side. In here, we're also gonna have our battery disconnect in this box right here. You'll find a lot of resettable fuses and stuff. Most of these are temperature controlled, so they'll automatically reset after they cool off if something's tripping. Uh, but it's an on off switch. We go ahead and just turn it off. It disconnects our battery power from the rest of our unit. We use that whenever we store our unit unplugged so we can conserve the amount of power in that battery that when we come back out to it to hook up, we have battery power. So when we are plugged in, using it or storing it, we wanna leave that switch on so our battery actually gets charged while it's plugged in. 
You'll notice another switch right here off and on. That is our solar disconnect. Completely different from our battery disconnect, it will shut off all of our solar system, including this Furion uh, controller right here. So it eliminates it from the system. If you, have, if you wanna go ahead and run your solar while your unit is parked, either unplugged or plugged in, go ahead and do it. This disconnect right here will not prohibit the solar from charging. So you can turn this off, that solar will still connect to that battery system and still charge. We do have our LCI levelers right here. They do have an override system on them. We can pull that plug out and we can see in there we do have a spot where we can put that crank handle and manually operate those in the event that our motor went out. If we do that, we do need to disconnect the 12 volts off of that motor before we go to operate it. The valve we talked about in regards to draining out our fresh tank, our onboard water storage is right under there. That's that white valve next to the two blue overflow lines for that fresh tank system. And right behind me underneath, you're going to notice a red and blue line. Those are for your low point drains those are whenever you're going to winterize your unit once again that more information on that can be found in your owner's manual all right moving down the driver's side of our unit we do have our tankless furion water heater right here that it will give you endless hot water it is heated by our propane system also needs 12 volts in order to operate over here we have our suburban furnace right there we'll go over the operation of that inside another gas powered unit also needing 12 volts to operate we have our 50 amp twist lock plug right here. We put it in, turn it to the right, lock it in. We have a little retainer ring on there. We wanna go ahead and tighten that up so kids running around can't accidentally unplug it and interrupt power to our system. Very important, we plug that in first right here and then we go plug in our shore power, help reduce any arcing on the plug right here. We also wanna make sure that our AC systems are off anytime we plug it in or unplug it so we don't have any surges to our AC system. Now down here, we're gonna notice our black tank and gray tank valves. We have that other gray tank valve in the front compartment, and this is where our port is gonna be. So our port is where we hook up our sewer hose. That's gonna to go to the campground sewer port or to the dump station, wherever you're at, and you're gonna pull your handles to dump your tanks. Now, if we have a port at the campsite, we can go ahead and leave those gray tanks open all the time. Our gray tanks are what our sink and shower water go into. That water can drain out of there, no problem. Our black tank, however, is where our sewage goes. We need to make sure that tank is holding water during that period because we're putting solids in there that we don't want to dry up and get stuck in that tank. So keep that valve closed until we are ready to dump and flush that system. So step by step, we go ahead, pull that valve open, we drain everything out, and then we hook up to our black tank flush there in the front, turn that water hose on and flush out that system. When we're satisfied, we shut that system off. We come over here, we close that black tank valve, we go on the inside to our toilet, we hold down that pedal and we add several gallons of fresh clean water to our system. We will always wanna keep water in there, whether there's sewage in there or not. Always, always, always keep water in there and then we can go ahead and add our chemicals. As you drive down the road, there is stuff that will be stuck to those side sensors, tanks, so on and so forth. That water will help wash all that stuff down. The chemicals will help break it down as well. If you want a pro tip on how to flush out your black tank, you can find that in the HAPS Helpful Hacks section of our Great American RV YouTube channel. We're gonna notice our rear leveler right here. We can override that one by pulling that black plug out right there, disconnecting our 12 volts from it, putting a socket in there attached to a drill, and we can automatically retract that system with the drill in the event we need to override it. Our rear slide out is gonna be a rack and pinion slide. All that stuff goes through a frame. There is an override on the other side. There's a hole in your J-wrap right here, opposite of that slide where a little pin lines up. You can put your crank handle on there and manually run that slide in in the event that it is not operating. On the rear of our unit, we are pre-wired for that Furion backup camera system. It has power to it whenever you turn your running lights on on your towing vehicle. That will power up our backup camera so we can see behind us while we're traveling down the road or backing up if you want to upgrade to that system. On here, we're also going to have that receiver hitch. That receiver hitch is meant for a carriage or a bike rack, not for towing your boat, not for towing a trailer, anything like that not rated for that type of system, so keep that in mind. We also have our spray port right here, that quick connect, we move that blue coiled hose from the front to the back and have another wash station in the back. Also have our factory supply ladder right there to be able to gain access to our roof. Very, very important. Every 60 to 90 days, you need to get up there and check the sealant on all your vent sides and trims, as well as on all of your sidewall trims, windows, lights, all that stuff, to make sure we don't have any peeling, cracking, 
tearing or deterioration of that sealant. If we do, we need to clean it right away and go ahead and reseal over it. This is customer maintenance. Just like changing oil in your car, you need to maintain your unit to keep the water from getting in. If you don't, then that will get damaged. Manufacturers aren't gonna participate in that kind of damage because it is considered customer maintenance. After the first 90 days, manufacturers don't participate in that kind of stuff. So please, please, please make sure we're maintaining our sealant on our unit. The other thing we need to do on that roof is check after trips, make sure no low-lying tree limbs or anything scraped across our roof poked any holes in that rubber. We also need to clean that rubber at least once or twice a year. On the pasture side of our unit, once again, access to our pass-through bay right there, as well as our leveling system. We have that little black plug on each side because we have motors on each side. Same thing with our rear jacks to be able to override that system. As we move down, we have our awning 12 volt powered as well as our awning lights that are 12 volt powered as well. And all of that stuff will go back to our 12 volt fuse panel on the inside. We'll show you that it's near our 110 breaker. In the event that this stuff isn't operating, that's the first place we want to go. Now for our awning, it is mainly a sunshade, not intended to protect you from rain, wind, and all that stuff. If you do have heavy rain, you have a windstorm coming through, you need to roll that awning in. If you are leaving your campsite for an extended period of time, roll that awning in. I promise you, you don't want the insurance claim. Now, when we do use our awning, we will get some light dew, light rain, maybe even AC condensation on that awning. It needs to drain off. So we need to lower our awning either in the front or the rear. Both awnings are the same. Awning arms are the same. So we have the option on which one we want to do so that water can be directed appropriately. In order to go ahead and pitch it, we grab right here at this pivot point. We just pull down and that awning arm tilts our awning over to the side and it lets that water drain out. When we go to put our awning back in, simply just push it up and we're ready to go. Here under our awning, you will see a vent up there on the top of that slide out. That is for our hood range over our cooktop in order to ventilate that out. There are two tabs on there. You wanna make sure that those are open. That way it will actually ventilate out. If we don't, that air is gonna be locked in. If we want to go ahead and close it when we store our unit, keep any rodents from building any nests in there, we could certainly do that. Under here also, we have our 110 powered dorm fridge outside for our drinks. Once again, 110 powered, anytime we plug it in, that unit's gonna turn on. What's the refrigerator do? It gets cold and it freezes, right? So anytime we unplug our system, we're gonna to need to come over here and defrost this unit and get all the condensation out of it, as well as any standing water. If we don't, that water can leak out and damage our wood components right here. And like I've said before, manufacturers don't participate in that kind of stuff. This is customer maintenance to clean out and defrost our fridge properly so we can reduce the risk of that as well as any mold or mildew. Moving down on our slide, we have our cable outlet right here with our two ports for satellite or antenna cable. We also have our 110 GFCI protected outlet right here and that would be for our outdoor TV. On the rear, we're gonna notice that little hole right there is gonna line up with this pin under here. I know it's kinda of dark to see. We're gonna notice that pin right there. That is for our spare tire to be able to drop that down. Down below our fridge, we are gonna notice if we had that slide out closed, that little rod sticking out of there, that is the override for that other slide out over there. This slide out on the passenger side will have the same type of system. You'll notice the hole on the driver's side to override it. We're gonna notice under our entry door, we do have a quick connect for our LP system. If we wanna add an outdoor grill, we can certainly do that. On our entry door, we're gonna notice they have friction controlled hinges, keeps the wind and kids from slamming that door shut or open up against our wall. We have a magnetic latch there on the side. And next is our solid steps. We always wanna make sure this door is opened all the way when we store or open up our solid steps for the mere reason that we don't want these brackets scraping up our door and tearing it up. So for our steps to store them, pretty simple. Lift it up, make sure this latch right here latches onto that frame and we're good to go. We wanna bring them down, pull that blue lever right there and drop them down. Now, after we've leveled our unit, we wanna make sure we level our steps. Pretty easy to do. We have two silver tabs, one on each side. When we push them, we can move those legs up and down in order to level out our unit like so. And that would level our steps. We want a good flush threshold right here for our door to be able to close on. That way it will seal properly. We also wanna make sure that when we open and close that door, 
that our frame on the bottom of the door isn't hitting our steps and damaging it as well. As we walk in our door and our side cabinet, we're gonna notice our control center. That control center will let you know what our fresh tank, black tank, and gray tank levels are at, as well as our battery. We have this Bluetooth connect button right here. If we wanna download that Compass Connect app, we can go ahead and actually see some of these options and function some of them through that app. Our ceiling lights controlled here, as well as our awning lights our porch light and our tank heaters. Our tank heaters are a 12 volt mat to help protect our tanks in freezing weather. We would kick that on and it will heat those tanks. Our water pump right here will pull the fresh water out of that tank right there and supply it to our fixtures if we don't have a city water connection. If we do, make sure that pump is off. Now this will be an on-demand pump. It'll only come on whenever we are actually using that water. If you suddenly hear that pump running and you're certain that we're not using water, then we need to shut that system off because maybe our fresh tank is empty or we have a leak in our system. We don't want to burn that pump up. Down below, we have our awning and slide out controls right there. All of this stuff, 12 volt operated, and you'd find most of it down our 12 volt fuse panel down by our breaker panel that we'll see here in a minute. Down below our control center, we see our Furion thermostat that's going to control our heat and our AC for our system. We'll go over the operation of that now. We'll start with our cool option first. Our cool will cool the air throughout our unit. We, of course, sit our thermostat to whatever point we want it to be. And we have our fan speed options. We have low and high. For low and high, that fan will run all the time. Now, whenever we want that fan to cut off, whenever the compressor cuts off, much like we likely do at home, we have it on auto. That system will shut off and on with the compressor. Our next mode is our heat mode. Our heat mode activates our gas powered furnace on our unit. We choose our set point and our heater will come on whenever necessary. There is fan speeds on here, but it does not change the fan speed on that furnace. It is a single fan speed on there controlled by the furnace board. Our next mode is our fan mode. Our fan mode simply circulates air throughout our unit without cooling it or anything. This will come out of our rooftop air and we can just change from high to low to control that fan speed if we wish. That fan will stay on the entire time when we have it in our fan mode. Our last mode is our dry mode. Our dry mode is like a dehumidifier. We can choose our set point and it will cool our unit down to that set point and it will continue to cool past that, but alternate every six to 10 minutes off and on. That way it doesn't drop that temperature too low and freeze you out of the unit, but it still dries the air in your unit. Another thing to note with our furnace is that the air is going to come out of the vents on the floor. It's not going to come out of the rooftop air. Your only rooftop air is going to be your fan and your cool and your dry. Your heat will come out of those floor vents from the furnace. Below that we have our max air fan. Pretty simple on off for the fan four speeds. We have the open and close for the vent. It's going to control that fan vent in our kitchen. Down here we're going to find our 110 breakers as well as our 12 volt fuses behind here. This is where we're gonna go if some of those components aren't working. Everything is labeled on both the 110 and 12 volt side so you can see what they actually operate. Make sure fuses aren't blown and breakers aren't tripped. Down on the side of your island, you'll have your RV propane detector or LP detector. This will warn you of any LP that enters your unit. The alarm will go off. You'll see a green light on there, lets you know it's powered on. It is hardwired into your battery system. It's also going to have an expiration date either on the front or the back of it, letting you know when it expires, when it needs to be replaced. You're also going to have smoke detector and CO alarms in your unit. Those are powered by a 9 volt battery. All those need to be checked on a regular basis and the test buttons need to be uh, initiated to make sure the alarms go off before you go camping or at least on a regular basis. Our recliners do have the massaging seats, the heated seats, as well as the decorative lights down there on the bottom. And we also are gonna have our fold out sofa sleeper here on the side. For our entertainment, of course, we're going to have our Jensen radio system up here to control our indoor and outdoor speakers. And it has Bluetooth regular radio functions on there. We're also going to have our entertainment for our TV system. On the other side over here, you're going to see a little plate with two coax ports on it and a little button with a red light. That red light indicates when the antenna boost is on. That antenna boost is for when we're searching for air channels on our TV to help boost the signal and pick up more channels in that area. 
when we are searching for cable channels, meaning the campground has a coax connection for cable, we would scan for our channels, we want that light to be off, we can do that by pushing that red button, otherwise it's gonna scramble those cable channels. Down below, we have our 110 fireplace right there. If we, if we don't wanna use gas heat, we can use that electric element in there. We'll go over more information on how that works. Here we have our fireplace. We have a sensor right up here in the top right where we have to aim that remote at to turn it on. We have our Celsius and Fahrenheit temperature we can change to. And right here, this little flame icon is going to change the dimness of our flame. If we want to change the lighting of our flame, we hit the light bulb on the screen down here at the bottom, and it'll give you some different options right there. If we want to operate our heater on a timer, once again, electric heater, it is going to be this button right here. It looks like a clock, and when we push it, we can see some times pop up, one hour, two hours, three hours, all the way up to eight, and then it will go to zero hours, letting you know that that timer is off. If we want to change our temperature, we'll use one of these two buttons at the bottom, and we can see once again, we have a temperature down there, and we will go ahead and raise it until it kicks on, or lower it, we want it to kick off, or we can keep going until it says on, and that heater will stay running all the time. We kick it up one more time, and it's gonna say OF, meaning that that system is off. First thing in our kitchen is our 12 volt Furion refrigerator and freezer up top. We're gonna to have a little dial in there. That dial will go from off to cold to colder. And you're also gonna have an off grid option on there as well. The off grid option is for if we are dry camping somewhere, boondocking, we are utilizing only our 12 volt power that off-grid will lower the amount of work that the compressor is doing, but you do need to keep in mind you can't open and close that fridge so much and they expect that food to stay cold. So we have to be efficient with it whenever we use that option, but it will reduce the amount of 12 volts you're using. That way you don't run out of power so quickly. Now, one thing we need to remember about this fridge is that it doesn't have any drain hoses in it. So that means when we defrost it, we need to go ahead and get all the water out of here and wipe down our fridge reducing the risk for mold and mildew and the water to be able to escape out of there and damage our wood components around it. This is customer maintenance whenever we defrost and clean out our fridge for storage. The other half of our kitchen provides us with that 110 microwave. We do have the hood vent on there. That vent on the outside we talked about with two latches needs to be opened up for that air to actually ventilate out. Closed if you want to store it and have it closed. That way no insects can build any nests in there. Here we have our three burner Furion stove top. Glass cooktop is down for more counter space. It should also be down for travel. When we cook, we go ahead and flip that up. We have our three burners. Of course, we want our propane tanks on. We come over to that designated burner, turn it to the flame icon right there, and crank away until our flame lights. We'll also notice that each one of these knobs turns red when we light it up, letting us know that the gas is being emitted out of that system. I have a little light switch here. Those knobs will turn blue. They'll turn red when they're on. So a good little safety feature, especially if you have kids. If you flip it down, you'll also notice that the oven lights up too. Now, important thing about our gas system is it can end up with air in the system. This happens when we store our unit with the tanks turned off, which is very common to do that. No problem there, but whenever you turn it back on, you're gonna end up with air in your system. It can also happen when we change those tanks out. Very easy fix. We come over, we turn our tanks on, we come over here, we light our stove top. It may take a little bit of time for that air to finally bleed out and you start getting gas to the system for it to light, but that's how we bleed air out of our system. Once you've done it once after turning those tanks on, you won't have to do it again until you either turn those tanks off or change them out, one of the two. But I always suggest doing that before operating things like our water heater or our furnace to help prohibit those things from going into a fault mode due to air in the system. This is a simple fix for it. Now down here we have our oven. Oven is slightly different. We're going to go ahead and turn this one to the uh, flame icon right there, but we have to push this knob down when we manually crank to light it. Once it lights, hold it down for 30 to 60 seconds, let that pilot get warmed up, and then we're gonna turn it to our appropriate temperature, and you should see that burner tube light up from there. In our bathroom, pretty cut and dry, we do have glass doors with travel latches on them. Good idea to put those on so you don't shatter the doors. Our shower has hot, cold fixture. We also have a shower head that turns off and on. Why do you ask? Well, whenever you are dry camping, so you don't have a place to dump your gray tanks or you are using your fresh tank water, you wanna conserve the amount of water you're using out of that system as well as the amount of water you're putting in your gray tank. 
So in between lathering up and rinsing off, we can go ahead and just easily shut that water off at the shower head rather than having to fiddle with our hot and cold fixture right there to find that sweet spot again. If you have city water connection, you have a place to drain your tanks, go ahead and use it like you would at your house. Just leave those gray tanks open. We also have a vent up here with a fan on it. That vent is to be able to get and extract the steam and everything out of here when you're taking a shower, reduce opportunity for mold and mildew in here. It's suggested that you use that. For our toilet right here, we're only putting a few things in there. We're putting number one and number two, right? Liquids and solids. For liquids, do your business, hit the pedal, flush it down the drain. Solids, we need to make sure we're filling that bowl up half to three quarters of the way. We can do that by just barely depressing that pedal and it will begin to fill that bowl up with water. This helps to flush those solids down the drain into that black tank and I get clogged up in the pipe. Other things that we're putting in there is RV toilet paper and our chemicals. Make sure RV to toilet paper because it will degrade properly and the chemicals will help it do so. Don't put anything else in there. I promise you, you're going to regret it. It'll get caught in valves, be expensive repair. So just one, two chemicals and RV toilet paper. Over here, we have our Furion tankless water heater control. We'll go over the operation of that now. In our bathroom, we'll see our Furion tankless control center. Pretty simple. We have our power on, off and on, kick it on. That's going to be our set point for our water. We can change that by hitting our up and down buttons right there. Our indicators right here, power, Fahrenheit, Celsius. If we want to change one or the other, we hit that bottom right button and flame. Flame is only going to kick on whenever we turn that hot water on, indicating that system is working. And once again, on demand, it'll only come on whenever we have that hot water on. In our bedroom, we do have that second AC system, once again, with a dump valve that would need to be closed for it to circulate through our ceiling vents. Open it up if you want to cool off just this area. We have our separate thermostat for this one. This one is only going to run for this AC and it's only going to do cool. The heat is going to be controlled by that other thermostat. Behind me, we have our backer for our TV location along with satellite and cable coax ports right there. We are also prepped for that washer dryer in our closet and we have storage underneath our bed. Well, we hope you found that resourceful, but wait, there's more information on our Great American RV YouTube channel. This channel right here, find the playlist, Haps Helpful Hacks. We go over different products in this unit and we'll take a deeper dive with more diagnostics, more information, as well as helpful tips when you're out camping. Tell your buddies, tell your friends, like, share, subscribe, do all those awesome things on YouTube, TikTok, wherever you found us. And keep watching here at Great American RV Superstores, where we bring the how-to to you.